we are gonna take just a few minutes and we wanna answer some questions. But we wanna answer questions that you are actually asking and we wanna speak to challenges or problems that you're actually facing. And so I have here on my phone uh, a whole bunch of questions, great questions that you guys have texted in. And so we're gonna spend the next few minutes uh, answering some of those questions. Can you say thank you to all these guys for joining me up here? Hey guys, are your mics on? Let's get a little check. Let's get a little check, check one, two down the line. One, two, three. I like the number three. Yeah. Four. You do? Ron, I, I haven't like even asked four. any questions and you've already got opinions? I got opinions. It's three. great. <laughs> My number was 32. Well, I mean, I, it was 33. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. I'm going to just rip off some questions that we have uh, curated from these lovely folks here. And I love this one. I'd love to hear uh, just briefly from each of you. If you could just give me a name and a one-sentence reason why. Who is on the Mount Rushmore of leaders that have influenced your leadership? Ooh. Dang, it's Lyle Wells. <laughs> <laughs> Man! It's, why are you guys laughing? All right, he's we got Ron's. He's, he's been a, no, he's been an instrumental person, but go ahead. Um, this is when you're supposed to say my name. Yeah. <laughs> Well, R Mount Rushmore has four faces, and my statue only has one. So uh, I, would, I would say, um, as a young leader, there's a man named Dominic Capra, public school teacher, coach. Nobody's ever heard of him. He's never written anything. He didn't put anything out on social media. But um, everything the man taught me, he went and lived He lived it immediately uh, after he taught it to me. And that credibility and integrity of leadership had a profound effect. So good. Yeah, I think it'd be hard for me to think back on uh, the leadership influences in my life without thinking back to my own dad. My, my father uh, is a first-generation Christian in his family. Uh, when I was five years old, he became a pastor because he wanted to use his life in every way he could for the kingdom. And uh, my dad, above all other things, is a servant leader. So uh, I grew up in a home uh, that was always marked by leadership in very small churches, uh, planted churches. Uh, my dad to this day uh, rarely misses a new baby at the hospital. He rarely misses a graduation party. He does every funeral. He has done all the weddings he can do. So when I think of servant leadership and laying down your life for the sake of the flock, um, I'd put my dad on, on the mountain. Yeah, and in all, in all seriousness, I think when I think about a question like this, I think about different phases yeah. and ages. Yep. And so for me, yep. as I think about it, you know, I wouldn't be in positions of leadership without some of the coaches that invested in me yep. and saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. As I got into ministry, I mean, I think of, think of one or two people who helped me with discipleship, training, coaching, uh, preaching, that I wouldn't be the person that I am. And um, so there's been multiple numbers of people that, have invested over the years that uh, have helped me. Yeah, it looks like I got the wrong seat. What he said, what he said, I don't know who you were talking about. I mean, I was expecting at least like yeah. one John Wooden, George yeah, Patton, yeah. So, uh, we got dad. I resonate with what Adam and Ron said, uh, I think in decades. And so as an adult in decades, certainly first 20 years, my dad, um, I would say the last, I'm, I won't tell you what decade I'm in, um, but the last one, um, You'll hear him tomorrow, but Bo Hughes. Um, at, this stage of, at this stage of my life and my leadership, a, a man who uh, loves Jesus and whose devotion uh, for Jesus uh, marks his leadership is what I have needed. And so guys like Mike Bullmore, who um, we heard last year, uh, these men, I have a, a fresh, um, I'm not gonna put them on a mountain, because I'm, but uh, has a, a fresh value for their ministry. And uh, I'm trying to, I'm trying to take as much of it in as I can. That's great. Lyle, a question for you. Um, a lot of church staff and volunteer teams are marked by really high turnover. How can leaders foster longevity and commitment in the people that they're serving with? Uh, I think there's two really important things. If, if there were two words to remember, I think the first one is clarity. Uh, we said this morning, nobody wants to be average. And so I think anybody, whether they're a volunteer uh, or a staff member, they want to be successful. I mean, they're stepping in, they're exchanging their life 
for, for this work. And so I think creating clarity, what does it look like to win in your position? Not just how good are you, but how are you good? Uh, what value do you bring? Why, why do we celebrate you being part of our team? I think that's number one. I think the second one is connection. And I'm not talking about just relational connection. I think that's really important. But connecting into the culture. Uh, I've been challenging in my one-on-one -on -one coaching just this month. Uh, I call it, you know, the, the three-dimension conversation that leaders need to be having with their people. Number one is that functional, tactical, hey, here's what a win looks like. Here's what we're expecting. Here's what we're needing. Here's what we're counting on you for. The second is that personal. How are your kids? How's life going? Um, Jeff, you're, you're in another decade. You're doing okay, right? Um, so that personal thing is really, really important. But I think you also have to talk about cultural. Um, you know, you're, you, all of you have cultural values, but are you living them? Are you emphasizing them? Um, are you celebrating them to what Jeff just said? I mean, we have four at Integris four cultural values that we talk about all the time. We have a process statement where we say we want to do hard things with people we really care about and have fun doing it. And then we, we illustrate that, we celebrate that with people. And I think it helps them feel connected, both culturally and personally. But I think people nowadays, when you look at all of the studies out there, money's meaning less, yeah. titles mean less. It's, am I doing something that matters? It's really good. Anyone can jump in on this question. All of you have been leading for quite a while. And uh, at one point, you were a young man who was starting ministry. So we got this question. What would you say to a young man who is beginning in ministry but feels unprepared for what's ahead? That's a great place to be. <laughs> Honestly, I think there's two parts of the calling. There's the part that you understand mm -hmm. and this part you don't understand. And it's the people that don't have that second part and think they got the first part would get it wrong. And so if you understand what I mean is there's a part that makes sense. You know what? You've got some leadership. You've done some things. You've accomplished some things. Um, you can see that you have invested yourself in some ministry opportunities, and it's borne fruit. People have recognized, and they've placed their hands on you and said, man, that's awesome. You know, keep that going. But then there's just something inside of you. And I remember... Um, when I quit my job to go into vocational ministry, and I'm telling you, man, I, I, I didn't think I could do it. I didn't think I was worthy, and it was just so much pressure. And I, I'll never forget when I drove my um, company car back to uh, the offices in Cleveland, flew back to Chicago, and I sat down, and I felt like I just got punched in the gut. And I, I really believe I felt like it was an enemy attack. So I don't want to over-spiritualize it. But I was just like, what did I do? And I felt like I, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I think it gets back to the next question of to put yourself in places where people around you can really invest and yeah. grow and help you. Yeah. Because I don't think that we all get it. I think there's stuff we don't understand. And if, if I'm a little nervous, I think you're in a good spot. Because yeah. Moses was in that spot. He yeah. didn't think he'd do it. He didn't think he had the voice, and God prepared him and used him. So, Yeah, I would add to that, too. And that was a good sermon. I remember that sermon at Harvest <laughs> U back in the day. Remember that? God, you preached on Moses. You remember yeah. that? Yep, five excuses. Five, <laughs> five, five excuses. excuses. <laughs> we took notes. <laughs> Here's what I would tell you on that. Uh, I, I love that question. I think I love, I remember that, and uh, I love what Rhonda said. I think one of the greatest gifts and uh, that's why part of why we're here uh, this week. One of the greatest gifts is to find a group of uh, brothers and sisters that actually are walking the road. And if you can find a few that are just 100 yards in front of you, you can gain so much from the benefit of that friendship and those relationships. And uh, Ron is uh, an older brother truly in church planting to me. So uh, when I met him, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, now he had already been in it for 10 years. So he was, he was 100 yards out. He was a mile ahead. And if you can find those people and, uh, and really allow them to influence your life, there's a sweetness to the fact that you don't know what's coming, but somebody else does, and they're in your corner and they're on your team. So 
we talk a lot about fellowship and enjoying uh, the big C and the big movement of God. And man, movements are messy. They're big. Uh, they don't all fit together. It's just a big, powerful thing that God is doing in the kingdom. But there's, a, there's an aspect, aspect of tribe that is much smaller. That's where you find affinity. That's where you have relationship. That's where you're doing the same thing the same way and you're pursuing the same stuff. Young uh, leaders... Find the leaders around you that are doing what you're doing and love what you love and are just a little ahead of you. Humble yourself and watch what God will do through uh, older siblings in your life uh, in the leadership he entrusts to you. Let me, let me new, uh, add to that. Uh, intentional. Be intentional. You initiate. Don't wait for a leader to ask you to be part of something. Be intentional. You initiate. And then second, informal, not formal. So I, I've never taken a single leadership class. I was never in a leadership program. I don't, I've never, I don't know what those are. And so oftentimes as young leaders, we're, look, we're paralyzed because we're like, what's the, what do you have to develop me? And it's being with, as Adam was saying, it's being with. Find a context that you're like, man, I, I, wanna, I wanna lead like that. I wanna culture like that. I wanna be, be a leader like that and uh, informal. Don't, don't, don't wait for a pipeline or a program. I love what Jeff said, and I just want to say it like this. I, I kind of been saying this a long time. I've never been in a relationship, a meaningful relationship, that I didn't pursue. Mm -hmm. And so are you pursuing it? And, you know, people didn't chase me down. I went after a couple people who I thought, man, they got it. And, and so I would just say, chase that person down and invite yourself in and, and get moving. <laughs> That's good. Adam. Should we partner with leaders with whom we disagree theologically? <laughs> and if so, where do we draw the line? Mm. I'd like to defer the question. Bible, to transla <laughs> Bible translation. Bible translation. Gentlemen to my left. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that's not an easy yes, no question. It was framed that way. Um, yes, in one sense, you should partner with and work with people that you disagree with theologically. And there are some people that you disagree theologically with that you should never uh, partner with and you should not work with them because you're not actually pulling the same direction. You're in a tug of war. You're not actually pulling the same direction with them. So that all just brings up uh, what we would call around here, what uh, Al Mohler has uh, used for a long time, a theological triage uh, where there's first order business, there's first order theology that we cannot compromise, we cannot allow there to be another way of salvation and think that we're going for the same mission, there cannot be another God and we're still all together, like we can't do that and yet then there's second order issues in the church, in God's people with the gospel of Jesus Christ by grace through faith in Christ alone and his finished work where we are going to be different. And you can go a certain distance with those people that you disagree with for the sake of those big rocks of the mission. So first, there's first order and second order and maybe even third order issues of importance where we can partner and where we don't have to divide. And then there's a, there's a proximity in how we relate that comes second. So you can relate with people you disagree with on a limited level and uh, enjoy the fellowship of the saints and the unity of the bond of peace. Have you ever been on an airplane and uh, met somebody who comes from something that you're never been a part of, a stream of true Christianity that's just totally different than what you're a part of? But for those hours, you have an incredible amount of fellowship with a lot of disagreement because there's not a lot of proximity here. We're not, we're not latching onto each other. You get down into your local church, joining together with other believers, it's gonna have to be way more on the same page. The affinity is going to have to be much greater. So there's a scope and scale to partnership, and there's a triage of theology. And I think you're going to have to live in there, and uh, better minds than mine and uh, wiser, uh, wiser men than me have worked hard on this. So you can look up a little article, Theological Triage by Al Mohler. It'll give you a running start on something that's really helped me, kept us from being hyper, I would say hyper separatistic, uh, so we're always known for what we're not versus always celebrating what we are. And we share what we are with a lot of God's people uh, in the community in which we live. So be careful. I was just talking backstage with some of the other leaders. And I think one of the things that has to go away in our time amongst us as leaders is the constant degrading of the ministries we disagree with to elevate somehow the, the value of our own. Okay, I just don't want to be a part of it. I'm That's done. A good word.
Do I agree with all of the way church is done in this community by brothers and sisters in other churches? No, I don't. Am I going to make it our practice to degrade them so that we could somehow elevate the value of what we're doing? No, I will not. And I would celebrate God's work in them and uh, steward God's work here among us. And I believe that God will work out great things for his kingdom, and we will be a much brighter light in the community if we go that way. So I'm teetering on the answer. I'm not giving a hard answer because I don't think there is a hard answer except that there are a few basic things, probably the things in your doctrinal statement that made it into that. Those are going to be really key for who you can go really close and go really hard together. Otherwise, there's a lot of freedom for who we can fellowship with. It's why Ron's here. It's why Ron's I'm, here. I'm just grateful I got invited. If, if you knew how I'm much just, we disagree with him, I'm, I mean, it's it's nice to be here. He's the big brother. <laughs> kind of on the out, but that's all right. I just try to dress kind of nice it, and fit I, in. I would just say that in the theological triage, if you use the message, we can't be friends. <laughs> <laughs> or the NIV. See how quickly separatism gets I'm you with no friends? You get no I, I friends. Got redeemed Nobody's today. left. I'm on a little totally. island. And I was just representing a few of the people that wanted a little bit of different flavor. That's all yeah. I was trying to do. So. I don't know if that helps, but it does. It's good. That, that's really good, though. But I, I mean, honestly, we're joking and ha can, can have some fun. It's so great to learn from some other yes. people and hear how God's yes. at work in some different streams. So, you know, part of the thing is... I really like the collaboration and, you know, I've been involved in movements and opportunities where there isn't a lot of collaboration. Like I'll just tell, talk to you about Chicago for a moment and, and the city, you know, when we went through the crazy COVID, I mean, all the mega church pastors, we talked more than we ever talked ever. And it was just, it was just, you know, that's the one good thing that came out of it. So I just, you know, the relationships that you can have with people, but the deepening of it is, is you know, it's for people. That's, that, a, that's a good point. Uh, I think the question was to partner. Yeah, yeah, totally. Partnering with and learning from are two different things. And good you word. need to keep those away because you will learn from people you don't agree with in ways that you otherwise would not learn. And uh, I know that that gives you, some of you, that gives you the creepy crawlies to think that you would learn from somebody who you don't agree with. Let me encourage you to humble yourself. Uh, the churches that you don't agree with the philosophy of ministry, guess what? They're doing things that you desperately need to learn from them. And uh, we've just seen God use that in a big way here. So keep partnering with and learning from in two different buckets, and you'll be a much nicer person, and God will round out because this is a wide kingdom he has, and he's working out great things for his name. Yeah. Jeff, and this is a something, this is a great question, something that I really had to work on for a lot of years and still am. I want to delegate, but I'm afraid to let things go. How should I think about giving away responsibility to others? Yeah. <laughs> Jeff actually yeah. wrote the question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. How are you going to do with this one, big yeah. boy? I, I, yeah, I would start with the beginning of that and really um, really make sure I know why I want to delegate. So before we get into tactics or how or all that, but is what is driving this desire to give away? And all too often as leaders, we get, we, we've been taught, right, the three things you have to do and give everything else away. And what happens is that list under the three becomes the things I don't care about or the things I don't want to do. And that totally changes how we delegate, and it totally changes how we view the person in the process of delegation. So if, 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 we, if we can not delegate because I don't care about it, or it's not important enough for me to do, and we change that to say, I'm delegating because I care about the organization, and I care about the person I'm delegating to, then world's the difference. So... I know that that's probably not the answer to your question, but I think if we're driven by what's good for the person and what's good for the organization, then our actions are gonna reflect that and it's gonna change the scope of delegation. It's gonna change the, the, the timing of it. It's gonna change our response. Lyle talked about like, you're better than I am. Like you just, you wanna pay that tuition. Like there, there's gonna be, there's, there, there's, there's going to be tuition to be paid. There's going to be problems that have, but um, as a leader, you don't delegate ownership and full responsibility. Um, so you got to care about it. Uh, you can't, can't not be involved in it. Um, 
but it's going to change the way. So scope, I think of scope, I think a little at a time is good uh, for uh, oftentimes when we're leading organizations that are uh, executing products or services for people. Um, but it's with the goal of helping them be who God called them to be and help them use the gift that God has given them. Hey, not all delegation is created equal. Yeah. So you've for years, is it Lindsay only? Who gave you the five stages? It's Michael Hyatt's. Michael Hyatt's, yeah. yeah. So can, can you rattle those off? You got those in your noggin? Five stages of delegation? Uh, yeah, I'll try. Le level one, um, I do, you watch. Is that right? No. No, I can't. Chris, I you can't. got them? I mean, I thought we'd at least get like two of them. He turned your mic off. We're done, we're done talking to you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sit back down. Yeah, the Get key, back up here. here. Here's, here, here, here yeah. <laughs> the, the, the key on Michael Hyatt's, and you can read them, Michael Hyatt's five levels of delegation, the key is shifting from who's making the decision. That's the key. And there's a point where uh, the, the person you're delegating to, you're delegating tasks, you're delegating work, real work. Yeah. Go and research, That's right. go and find out, go and bring back how you think about this so that you have alignment with leader and team member who you want to delegate fully to get to a level five delegation where you're just like, you got it, you got it. But the, prob the problem, to if, if you don't do the work to get to level five, you haven't found that you have alignment and compatibility with the mission that you're on. So we don't care about it, we just wanna be done with it, we give a level five, and just say, go do it, they go do it, and it has nothing to do, it looks nothing like what you as the leader intended for your organization or your ministry to look like. And that's not good delegation. A couple of scary words that I've had over the years, because I'm just thinking about different people in different places where you're just getting something started, and if you didn't have the vision, it wouldn't have happened. If you didn't have the fingerprint on it, it wouldn't have went down, and, and it's like, I got it. I got it. No circle back, no follow-up, no discussion. Like, it's just like, do you have it really? And so I just think you got to be involved like that and trained to a point. Yeah, our, our matrix is a little bit different, but we ask the two questions. Can they do it and should they do it? Now, it starts with you, right? Can I do this and should I be the one to do this? And if the answer is yes to both of those, then leader, do it. But if we start asking about, how do I grow the other people around me? How do I give them real opportunities? I hate the word delegation. Delegation to me feels like take out the trash because I don't want to. Empowerment is, hey, I, I want you to start to build something. I want you to be a part of something. But here's the reason. You know, there are 400,000 churches in America. Half of them are less than 200 people because the leaders never grow. They never grow the people around them. They never allow, their opportun allow the opportunity for their organization to grow because they don't empower. So can they and should they? And so remember this, when you do for others things they can and should do for themselves, they never grow. And to go back to your first question about how do we keep people, you hire a high-capacity person and don't empower them, they're looking for a job tomorrow. Maybe later today. That's really good. To piggyback on that same concept, uh, someone texted in this question, how do I balance maintaining high standards of excellence while I'm raising up underdeveloped leaders? How do you balance between letting things go and knowing that they, there will be a degradation in the quality? Yeah, can they do it is the first question. If they can't do it, you cannot delegate to them. So the standard doesn't drop because of this value of empowerment. Expectation for how God has uh, called you to lead your organization, your ministry. Uh, so be very careful on how you communicate what excellence is and what the standard is. And don't let go of it until you've appropriately trained and, and are confident that they have the capability to execute it. Yeah, I mean, the way I look at it is, you know, what's the, what's the cost to the loss, right? On a Sunday, I mean, on a Sunday morning when you're full, uh, the cost is significant if, if somebody underperforms. But on a Wednesday night or a youth service or whatever, like, like let's, let's kind of stagger them onto the big stage. You know, you, you, your first game's not game seven of the World Series. 
And so I think you, you, you have opportunities like that. And whether it's, hey, you're going to start at youth camp or you're going to do, you know, Wednesday night services or whatever, give them opportunities to grow and, and flex. You know, and I love w what Michael Hyatt says, Jeff, is the first time you're in charge, you're not in the cockpit alone. Somebody is right there. So if it does start to drift, we can fix it. Kevin Peck, who's the lead pastor of Austin Stone, I don't know if Matt's in here, but Matt Carter, who's preaching tonight, planted Austin Stone. Uh, recently, he told me, Jeff, it's critical to build a culture within your church to value the growth and development of people in ministry. So while the, while the result isn't um, the, a little uncomfortable, but you used uh, supermodel referring to Adam and Ron. Slightly uncomfortable. Accurate. <laughs> It's a stretch. But but here here let's, where are we where are we going with this? Yeah. Yeah. Let, let's get let's get real. In our churches, in our churches, when the lead pastor who God has gifted to proclaim his word in a unique way is not there on a Sunday, our churches can respond in a myriad of ways. One, if they know ahead of time, the parking lot's empty. Two, they can celebrate the fact that God has provided and using other people who are growing in their gifting. And that's a culture we want across all ministry, not just on stage on a Sunday, but in our studies, in our small groups, in our ministries, to have a culture of, man, we get to be, a, man, I heard that guy when he did his first talk mm -hmm. on the mission fatigue. Like I was there when, the first, when he did his first talk. It's funny that you say that, because yeah. what I was just about to bring up was I, re I remember 10 years ago, the first time I preached at Christ Church. Oh, we do too. <laughs> yes, we do. Yes, we do. I was getting there. Was, was, that that <laughs> was that that funny video you showed? It was five, it was five excuses. Five excuses. <laughs> and you stood up before, uh, Pastor Adam stood up before I got up, and he said, we are a church. I, I was not ready for the opportunity. I was uh, humble and eager to learn, but wasn't quite ready to do that and certainly wasn't quite ready to sit in uh, Adam's place. And he stood up and said, we are a church that's committed to raising up young men to preach the gospel. And that was his way of doing two things, of instilling in everyone else the value that Jeff just talked about, that we give opportunities to young leaders and bracing them for the fact that the sermon was gonna suck. <laughs> Correct. Let's just call it what it is. So, Next question. So, so listen, on excellence, when you talk about you, you, you have a burden for excellence, excellence is not an end. It's a means. It's not an end. So the game is not for excellence. The game is for glory. So excellence matters. But listen, listen, that means that excellence is a progression. We get more excellent. We don't either hit it or we don't. So a lot of times with your people and your teams, you're helping them be more excellent so that there's more clarity for glory, more on-ramp for the gospel, more uh, clearing away of distractions. That's all more excellent. So uh, we're pursuing more. And I think if you have a devalue of excellence, then you've got to train that up. Why is excellence so essential to our ministry? Why does it matter? Why do we have the standards that we do? Why are we doing what we're doing? But you've got to know, loved ones, listen, we started as a church plant and excellence on day one does not look like excellence in year 10. And that's, that's the way it's always been. So uh, I came here preaching here. Uh, I believe the Spirit's given me a gift to preach. So I'm preaching, I planted a church. God is blessing it, we're working. And it was in those early years where I went to some training thing that we did, and Ron actually was my mentor for preaching and watched me on a video. And I, I'm, not, I'm not overplaying this just because Ron's sitting here. Like, that actually has been formative. That changed my preaching, and it liberated me in a different way. It helped me to communicate in a way that would be to uh, our people far more effective. And that was not because the preaching wasn't pursuing excellence. It's because it got more excellent because of the influence of leadership around it. Does that make sense? So don't destroy your people 
who love what you love and want what you want, but need to be more excellent in how it is expressed. Just you walk very patiently. You love them. You rip off every handwritten sign on the wall and you throw it in the trash. <laughs> and you smile at them and say, that's a great idea to have a sign. Let's get a better one. Been here. I would have had the slides of the graphics you made that were excellent back in the day. <laughs> that's cruel. That's a cruel thought. Those were excellent. Hey, they? I'm a church planter. I made slides. Let's go. And they live in the vault. We don't need to see them. All right, you is guys that, that got help? energy for a couple more questions before we go? Are we doing all right? We're doing okay? Okay. Here's a question. How do we as leaders give ourselves wholly to those we serve while not neglecting those in our own home who deserve our best? You, Ron. I was the one that didn't say anything about um, young leader. Uh, and um, I'm glad I didn't because this is a more relevant time to talk about this. Um, I'm going to write a book called Stupid Things That Smart People Say. Um, I'm interviewing Ron Zappia for it right now. <laughs> He's going to be chapters five, six, seven, and eight. But um, I know when not to say anything. <laughs> there, is, there is a belief out there that life is a marathon and not a sprint. Um, that's, that's the most nonsensical thing that I've ever heard said about leadership. Um, we're the only animals that multitask. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. But watch National Geographic Channel, right? When a, when a mother lion is nursing a baby, she's not hunting, right? When the pack of hyenas are hunting, right, they're not, they're not complaining about the rest that they're not getting. I mean, the, every other animal, when they're focused, they're focused. Life is a series of sprints. And so how do you give yourself wholly to the people you're called to serve and still have a healthy family? When you're working, work sprint, get, give it everything you have, come with the same intentionality and intensity you've come here. But then when you're done, you're done. It's over for today. Uh, I heard a pastor uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was in a conversation with him and he had just come off sabbatical and he said, I said, what's the best thing you learned? And he said, here's what I learned. I learned that, that I could at 5.30 stop working even though I wasn't empty. Because for the first 20 years in ministry, I thought I couldn't be done until I was empty. And now he's going home with something left in the tank. And then at home, you're in a full-on sprint, right? I mean, you're, you're making your spouse feel like they're not the most incredible person on the planet, that they're the only person on the planet. You're demonstrating to your kids that you wouldn't trade them for anything in the world. And so the first thing I would say is understand that it's sprints, and there's a time to sprint. Easter's coming. That week is a 70, 80-hour week for everybody in this room. It's going to be a sprint, but then we're going to build time on the back end of that to go, okay, we've just sprinted. Now we need a little recovery time. What does that really look like? Yeah, you can't, you can't add to that. Yeah. I, I put the question in, so... I was the one who wrote it. It's, I, I'm just afraid to say anything. I would like, no, I, I want you to say something. Uh, no, stop. No, I, you know what? I think, I think, I, I serious, love the language. I, I do love the language. And uh, honestly, it, um, it's Talking an emotional top, topic because, yep. um, you know, you see so many on the other side yep. and the woundedness and the hurt and, you know, kids that are going in a different direction. And you know what? Hey, we can't control all that, but there's a lot of things that you can do that can, can really help to mitigate that. And so I love what Lyle is saying because I've always thought of it, you know, I, it, it's rhythms, you know. I mean, there's rhythms in ministry that, that are so important. So I, I don't seek balance. I'm not a balanced person. I'm not. I, I seek the rhythms, and my family knows the rhythms. But I think the proudest probably thing that I can say as a dad that I'm thankful for you know, I've got three daughters. Uh, my two oldest are married. They married some great guys that love the Lord, come from a stock of Christian family that we didn't. I mean, our kids, I, I always joke with our kids. I'm like, man, you know what? We're the first Christians in our family. And 
And you, maybe if you knew the first Christians in your family going back and back, they're like, that guy was crazy and he did this. I'm like, that's us. And, <laughs> and you know what I mean? That's your mom and dad. And you know what I mean? And, and so, so three girls, two of them are married. You know, one's back home now, um, got a job in the area and she's 22. And, and I, I think that the win that I had was they always felt like I had time for them. They always felt like they were number one. They always felt like they're important. That didn't mean I went to every game. That didn't mean I did everything. Um, but, but, but they felt that, and they sensed that. I mean, I jokingly, we, I was speaking um, last week, and, and I, I took a phone call from my youngest daughter during the message. And I'm like, well, I, guys, I'm sorry, but I, I wanted her to know that she's really important, and I was concerned about something, and I'm joking, but I'm also communicating something to the church and to the people. <laughs> but you know what I mean? I, I mean, it's really important. It wasn't a church service on a Sunday. It was a gathering of leaders. But my point is, um, I think if my girls were here, they would say they always felt valued and that I, I had time for them. And I think a lot of times what happens is, is we don't. And so it looks different. Um, you know, Jody and I, um, you know, she's got to place the ball on the tee for me sometimes um, with three girls. It's like, you know, hey, she needs to hear this from you. No, get up there and like, can you write that down for me, please? And I'm just reading it, you know, but, but the truth is like, like the, the different times and the seasons of battle of not being united, um, you know, I mean, uh, and, and the church not understanding that your kids can fail and, and, and don't have to be perfect and all that kind of stuff. I, I just like those are all wars. You know, I remember, you know, I was joking around at our church. We started a Saturday night service because I wanted my kids to go to church because they were all in travel sports. <laughs> That's why we did a Saturday night service. It was for my kids. And. Um, but, but in all joking aside, like, you know, the kids would be in uniforms and, you know, be sitting in the front and we'd bust them out to the street. Like, like you just make some accommodations that, that you don't always make. And I, you know, as a young pastor though, this is just me. Cause I'm, I'm, uh, I, when I was first starting out, I never wanted to put myself in a place where, um, my kids were coming up to me and I was focused on some counseling or something after a service. And then I had to feel like I was neglecting them and they were pulling on me and, and I, I, this is just me. This isn't for everybody. Jody and I, when we started our church, uh, we had someone who took the kids right after the service. They took them home. Um, they gave them a meal. Like, like I got them out of there. I didn't want them running around and me ignoring them and, and what that looked like so that when I was done and I came home, then I, they always have my full attention. So we didn't always get that right, but, but that was helpful to me. I think anyone who's led has been in this situation. How do I redirect a volunteer who is earnest, but serving in an area where their gifts are weak? Honesty. Yeah, honesty is important. Here's the thing. We want people to serve where they will thrive, not so that we can survive. So if you're staffing people to serve so that you can survive and you're using them, there's a way that that feels over time with the people that are serving. And it'll be very hard for you to step in and say, you're terrible at this and you need to not do it anymore. I was only doing it to get your thing done. I was only doing it because you recruited me to do this. If you're if our focus as leaders is on our team serving where they can thrive, then you can identify with them, I don't think this is the best fit for you to thrive in ministry. And I love it that you love ministry, and I want to help you get where you can do it better. I want to be in a better spot for you. I want you to be plugged into a different spot. Now, I know. I know what it's like. We planted church. I, I planted two churches. I totally understand what it's like when the boat is leaking, and you're just trying to plug the holes with people. And so you're just like, you know, warm body, says they love Jesus, boom, they are in there. And it's survival mode. I understand that. Be very careful. Keep before your volunteer team, your servant teams, that you want them to serve in a way that they will thrive in their gifting, in the needs, and in the capacity that God has given to them. If you get them there and they shouldn't be in a role anymore, build the culture that always says we're always looking for how to best use our lives thriving in the Spirit's gifting for the kingdom. If that's always on the table, you get to have a conversation that's wired differently than, hey, I hate to tell you this, uh, but you shouldn't do this anymore. And, and I know you can't avoid it. Sometimes it'll just be an offense. There's no way around it. 
And uh, some of you who are in revitalization work, it's a totally different game for you because Sally's been doing the cookies in the fellowship hall for 47 years. They've been terrible for all 47 years. <laughs> and now you're there. What are you going to do? How are you going to have that conversation? I have no answer for you on that. So, Well, here's what you do. You bring in Integris and you say, yes. Sally Integris says you can't make cookies anymore. So... Here, here is a good, here's a good. My coach says, yes, "Bring in the no, consultant." There's a, good, there's a good, there's a good line. I tell this to family members who tell me, a lot of times, uh, children, adult children of parents will say, "How can I help my parents change?" And I just would say to them, "That's rarely what God uses." But what I, what you can do is be a conduit for a third party, who will speak into your parents' life and will influence them, and they will listen. And I would actually take Lyle's counsel. And at times, it is far better to bring a third voice in who can do things generally. They don't know Sally. Now, Lyle might know that Sally's in the room. You might know it's one of the issues, but he doesn't know Sally. What you with is we're going to pursue excellence in every way we can, and every person serving should be serving where they best fit and where they have the most ability. And I want to give a green light for the leadership here to really step into this. Are we ready? Are we on this? That third party buys you an opportunity to have a conversation that you otherwise couldn't have. So that's just a that's just a little, I don't know. This is a pastoral, practical thing that is a it's kind of a gnarly part of our life is uh, walking through those conversations. I hope you won't have it. Here's what we're experiencing. Like, let's not wait 47 years to talk to the lady about the cookies. You know, let's not wait a year and a half to tell somebody, hey, you've been a crushing disappointment in this job. <laughs> so so set set a framework of. I mean, of a 30-day conversation or a 90-day evaluation.